Paul Thomas Anderson and Daniel Day-Lewis did something special in 2007 when they made the film There Will Be Blood. This is The Actors Room. My name is Jeff Tarowski and this is episode 114. I hope you enjoy this show as I highlight a film that I love and I hope that you do too. We'll talk a little bit about it. I hope you enjoy it. Here we go. There is something about this movie. The premise, for me, seems pretty damn boring. Am I right? Let's set it up. The main character, Daniel Plainfield, is an oil man. He drills it, he prospects it, and he tries to sell himself and his product, oil. He goes and he tries to convince people around him that own land that he will make them money by drilling on their site sounds like a really interesting movie right no it doesn't but Paul Thomas Anderson wrote it and directed it felt that it would make a tremendous story for back in the early days of this country's history oil was key and it was a big part Of our past. For Paul Thomas Anderson. The story of a young America. Sort of going through the shit. And building itself up. Was grounded in all of the. Hard work. Dedication. Of men like Daniel Plainfield. Who had a vision. Who had a goal. Who saw something in front of them. And worked hard. To make their goals happen and come true for Daniel Plainfield he was a hard working man but there was something missing in him around him a part of his life there was something missing and that was a family there will be blood let's talk about the title what does the title mean there will be blood is it spilled blood with hard work and dedication in drilling oil yes There is a lot of blood spilled over the hard work there is in drilling. The sort of hard work it takes. The hours. The sweat, the tears, and the blood to make a business like this work. And you can see in the film the accidents that take workers' lives. The way they do in mine shafts. This is hard work and dedication. So in that sense, the title There Will Be Blood makes sense. But can also mean family. Daniel Plainfield is looking for that family aspect in life. And it is centered around this film. There will be blood. Blood relatives. And sometimes it doesn't have to be just blood. For somebody you love that is not related to you. They are just like family. You don't have to be blood related to love someone, to feel for them, root for them, and to ultimately be there for them when they need you. This film touches on many aspects of the human identity. What it takes to make it in the world, not just with business, but with your personal relationships and how much they mean to you. Think of how much your family means to you. Think about how much you do for them and what they give you in return. For that is one of the greatest gifts of life. Paul Thomas Anderson directed this film and he wrote it. And there was one person in his mind as an actor that can play the role, the title role of Daniel Plainfield. And that of course was one of the most talented actors to ever walk on this planet besides Marlon Brando. Mr. Daniel Day-Lewis. I did an episode about him a couple years ago. He is an intelligent, uh, seasoned human being. 
And he is a fascinating case study, not only as an actor, but as a person. Folks, he retired from acting a few years ago. And it hurts me to just think about all the roles we'll be missing. Because he decided to hang up his cleats. Acting cleats, hanging them up. And that's a really sad thing. Because he was one of the greatest actors ever. And some say he is the greatest living actor today. And he's not working. Why did he stop working? Maybe we'll talk about that at the end of the episode if I remember. (laughs) I hope everybody out there is doing great. Thank you for listening. And let's talk a little bit about There Will Be Blood put out in 2007. Starring Daniel Day-Lewis, Paul Dano, written and directed by Paul Thomas Anderson. I went and talked about a little bit about the title. And I talked a little bit about the main character, Daniel Plainfield. But before I get into the film, I want to lightly touch on the relationship between Paul Thomas Anderson and Daniel Day-Lewis. They respect one another. And Paul Thomas Anderson got lucky that Lewis was available to do the film. It's not easy to get this actor to do your project because he's picky. Or was picky. He retired. But when Lewis was working, and you take a look at his resume, it's quite astounding how many films he's done. Not that many. And at times in his career, especially near the end, there was a significant gap between projects. And I'm talking about years, folks. Years between films. There are some actors out there who work constantly. Actors that do six, seven, eight projects a year. Daniel Day-Lewis did only a handful of films and shows, but is considered to be one of the greatest ever. It's almost unimaginable to me how someone like him could do that and still be classified as one of the greats ever. It's a story that is almost impossible. And yet, there it is. So we are uh, lucky and blessed ourselves, just like Paul Thomas Anderson was, to witness performances like Lewis. And in this film, he did that. He also did that with Gangs of New York. Very similar style and grace and focus. He's there. He's in the moment. And he takes time. Conjuring up these personalities. For this is not like the real Daniel Day-Lewis. And Daniel Plainfield is his creation. He had a basic idea. PTA gave him the script. But then he took time. And he conjured him for within himself. And it's amazing to me. When I watch this film. How wonderful he really is. All the emotions that he displays for us to see. It's a clinic in excellent acting. And a reason why I love to do this show is dissecting and talking about projects that produce amazing work. And thank God for somebody like Paul Thomas Anderson and Daniel Day-Lewis to give us a movie like this to appreciate To love and respect. Daniel Day-Lewis' acting strategy, so to speak. And his approach just being an actor is slow, studied, meticulous, and personal. So personal that Lewis himself sometimes finds it difficult to describe how he goes about it. So how does he go about it? How does he give us performances that, for me, knock me on my ass? 
What's the recipe? What's the formula? And he's been asked this. And it's almost like pulling teeth, getting that answer out of him. Because it is so personal. It's almost like either he doesn't want to give it away or he just doesn't want to talk about it. It's that personal. And I get it. Because it works. You could tell. Daniel Plainfield, the character he plays in this movie, all the choices that Lewis made make him great. Make him deep and emotional. And then he goes extra with trying to hide that in his character. Folks, this is such deep acting. I almost think that people just don't see it because it's so good, so natural, and it seems so real. Daniel Day had the ability to do that in front of the camera. It's a special thing, and you see it, and there will be blood. His approach to the role, based solely at the beginning, around the voice. His voice was very important to Daniel. He had to get that right. And although there is that much audio of people in that time period, we're talking about the turn of the previous century. There's not that much audio. So it's almost like a creation for him. And he did listen to a lot of old clips. And John Huston, the famous director and actor from long ago. And this is Angelica Houston's dad. And I heard he was a very interesting guy. Folks, the more I do this show, <laughs> amazing to me. How interesting these people are. And I'm not talking about their work. I'm talking about their personal life. I mean, I heard John Houston was into a lot of weird things. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> and why did Daniel Day Lewis retire from acting? And these are questions that pierced my mind. And I question what's really going on in the entertainment business. And I find myself trying to search and figure out what's going on. And I hit the wall or a wall when I try to do that. Um, And there you go. I I babbled about the business. And I'll do that on my show uh, because that's reality. Um, A show I do. About a film leads me to avenues about other aspects of their lives. Why did Daniel Day Lewis stop out of nowhere, right in the middle of one of the most successful careers in the history of film? And some will say he reached his pinnacle, he accomplished all he wanted to accomplish, and that was it. He made enough money. And he can just go on wherever he wants to live. I believe he's Irish and or Scottish, whatever. And just be, take up a hobby and do whatever he wants. Is it because it took so much out of him with these roles? The years, he would prepare for years with the role, do the character, And then when it's over, he finds it hard to let it go. So he spends a significant amount of time after the film trying to figure out his life again and shedding off the character he created and became a part of and almost became this person. So maybe in that, he was tired of diving so deep that it took so much out of him. He couldn't take it anymore. And that might be it. Is that it? Or is it because he saw stuff in Hollywood and in the business that turned him off so much so he walked away? Figuring I made my money, I've done a lot, I'm well established, I, I, I made all my goals. And I can walk away and feel good about it. Daniel Day was never big on the Hollywood scene. And I'm babbling about Daniel Day, that's all right. It's my show, and he was in this film, so that's okay. (laughs) 
I'm just fascinated with why he left. Why? Dude, weird. If you're an artist, you never stop your art because you love it so much. It's a driving force in you. So how much did he really love acting then? Maybe not that much. I don't know. But I find it fascinating. I would love anybody's comment about how they feel about this. Why do you think Daniel Day-Lewis hung up his acting cleats and walked away? Was it easy for him? Or was it a tough decision? Well, I love it so much, but I hate the business. You know, the politics. What did he see? And how did it make him feel? Many interesting questions. Yeah. <laughs> it is juicy stuff. And I like it. But this show in the actor's room is going to talk about There Will Be Blood. But Daniel Day-Lewis is a big part of why There Will Be Blood was successful. Another part is Paul Thomas Anderson, of course. He wrote this damn thing. He directed it. This was his project. He got Daniel Day to do it. Thank God. (laughs) But this was his baby. And the writing in this is right on. He's very talented. Paul Thomas Anderson knows his shit. (laughs) He can write. He can direct. And he loves Daniel Day-Lewis. Those two have chemistry. No doubt about it. Book it. Write it down. They're amazing together. It shows in this movie. An oil movie. Ray, who gives a shit about oil? Hey. (laughs) Paul Thomas Anderson does. And now I do. But it's more than that, of course. You're interested in that aspect of the film. uh, The early days of the country and how it became successful in that way. Heading west. uh, Finding gold and oil. And creating this wealth. And just creating opportunity. Through hard work and dedication. Daniel Plainfield. The main character in this. Wants to be successful. And will do anything. To find success. But in the middle. Of all his drive. There comes a point. Where family. Should be. His happiness. And why couldn't he. Hang on to that. We'll get into it in the actor's room. This film was loosely based on the 1927 novel called Oil by Upton Sinclair. It's about business, religion, and family. And Daniel Day as Daniel Plainfield battles all three of these critical aspects of the film. It's his hard work as an oil prospector that finally pays off as he strikes oil near the beginning of the film. And if you notice, there is no dialogue in the beginning of this film for at least 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. And that's a significant amount of time. Uh, A big moment in the beginning of the film is one of Dan's co-workers dies. It's a dangerous business. It's a dangerous job. And people get hurt and sometimes killed. One of his workers dies and he had a son. The worker had a son, young boy, and now he's an orphan. The main character, Daniel Plainfield, feels responsible and takes in the child. And it's touching to see Daniel Day-Lewis with the child on the train. And the little boy is tugging at Daniel Day-Lewis's facial hair. Take a look at Daniel Day-Lewis looking at the child. There's true, that's just uh, human emotion. Uh, Human moments between uh, a man 
and a child. It's intimate, it's personal, and it's real. One of my favorite moments in the film is watching the little child, the little boy, pulling on Daniel Day Lewis's mustache tank. And it goes to show the the touching relationship that Paul Thomas Anderson wants to reveal to the audience. That's my belief. And how he was able to make Lewis feel comfortable in that atmosphere on the set or just in the project. Um, It's hard, I think, uh, for moments like that, although it may look easy or just a silly, uh, not very important moment in a film when you've seen this movie before, uh, you may not remember that moment. I do. And every time I watch this movie, I look out for that, that moment. He's looking down at the little boy with uh, loving eyes, carefully, and doesn't mind the little boy touching him. And, and uh, that's an important um, feeling uh, in human emotion. To reveal that. And for Paul Thomas Anderson to show that. Where other directors may not have put that scene in there at all. But for me, uh, that's an important scene. Because it shows a a man and the character vulnerable. Vulnerable. Uh, uh, Mr. Tough Guy Oil Man, right? Nobody get in my way. I'm going to make millions of dollars. I'm a ruthless businessman. Uh, Shares a moment with the child that's touching. Showing vulnerability in a man, no matter if they're tough or not. You're still a human being. Looking down on a, a beautiful, innocent, loving child who just lost his father. Because of your business. And in that moment, Daniel Plainfield, a.k.a. Lewis, takes the boy in his heart. Think about that. Now, Daniel takes in the boy and sort of uses him in his business, the family business. Now, this is the thing. I believe that Daniel Plainfield does deeply care for the boy, of course, like I said. But does he love him? Is there a difference between caring and loving? You can care for something, but do you necessarily love it with all of your soul? Not just your heart, but your whole being. Because that will play into the ending. And from my personal opinion, does he love the boy? Yes. You may not feel that way because of the way he treats him near the end of the film. Because it just doesn't make any sense, right? And maybe it's hard for him to love? No. He shows his appreciation for the boy. And brings him into his world. He is now a part of his world. As the businessman. And as a man. Daniel ultimately. Uses the boy. For his business. As a prop. The family business. He brings his new son. (laughs) uh, With him. To business deals. Is this ethical. I say it depends how old the boy is. <laughs> I mean, he's bringing this boy with him as a, as a very young person. He's getting uh, right from the start, right from the jump, <laughs> a look into the oil business. And in Daniel Plainfield's mind, this is very important. He wants to create a dynasty with his son because he is now telling prospectors, businessmen 
that this is my boy and it's a family business. And he tells people, he knocks on doors. I want to use your land to drill oil. And I'm a family man. Here's my son, you know, you know, a beautiful young man, you know, he's going to come up with me in the business. He, Daniel professes how all of his employees live on site and it's a family. It's a family atmosphere. So he, he tries to make people feel warm inside. Not only am I a good man, but I'm going to give good business. And we're all going to profit from this. And it's all going to be like one big family. And he makes that very clear. And I want to point out before I move on. That Daniel Day Lewis's relationship with his father. His real father, by the way. Is significant on how Daniel himself portrays this role. I do. If you dive into Daniel Day Lewis's past, you will find that his father and Daniel himself had a rocky relationship. His father was much older. <laughs> and I I believe Daniel Day's real father had Daniel when he was in his 50s. So yeah. Uh, you know, there was a disconnect and although Daniel's real father loved him very much, he just had a hard way of showing it. And when his father died, I believe Daniel was a teenager and he felt that he didn't do enough in his life for his father to appreciate him and carry that with him for a very long time. I don't know how long. But there was this burning desire within Daniel Day-Lewis to be successful, no matter in what way, just to make his father proud. And I do believe Mr. Daniel Day-Lewis's father died right after he saw his son perform in his very first theater production. His father passed away soon after that. And Daniel has been forever chasing this phantom in making his dad proud of him. So as a father, I think Daniel Day Lewis holds that in high respect. He's a father himself now and brought that with him into this character. And it was important. And there are actors that use that. And these are the actors that produce rich quality performances. Another great example is Sean Penn. He does the same fucking thing. And I think he's amazing. Sean Penn. Okay, moving on with the film. We are then introduced to a very important part of the movie when religion is now brought into the equation. For we meet the Sunday family. They have land and one of the family members dangles their land in front of Daniel Plainfield saying, oh, we have oil just seeping out of the ground where we are. Give us money, okay? Uh, We'll give you some land and you won't regret it. So Daniel Day-Lewis goes off, does a little prospecting on their land and is convinced that, yes, this will be valuable to me. And tries to convince the family, the Sunday family, that it is in their best interest to let Daniel drill on their land. It'll be profitable for everyone. You'll make money too. It'll be beautiful. We have to mention this actor, Paul Dano, who played uh, one of the twins. And I have to tell you, uh, I'm not the biggest fan of Paul. But, boy, did he nail this role. Uh, He's not a bad actor. He seems like he's kind of a prick. This is my show, and I can say what I want on my show. I'm sorry. I say what I feel about people, and I could be completely wrong. Paul could be one of the greatest people ever. And But I just get a vibe from Paul. Paul, I hope I'm wrong about you. He's not listening, so it's okay. But, but as, a, as an actor, 
he, he couldn't have done a better job. He couldn't have. Nobody could have, is what I mean. He was supposed to play uh, a minor character, and the other actor didn't work out. And Paul Thomas Anderson decided at the last minute <laughs> to have Paul do the role. Both twins. He was supposed to be the, uh, the less seen twin. And he ended up being Eli. <laughs> the, the one you see throughout the rest of the film. That was supposed to be played by another actor. Well, something happened with him or whatever. He was out. So Paul was promoted, so to speak. Um, so he didn't have much time to prepare for the role. It was a last minute thing. Take this into perspective. Paul Dano prepared two weeks for Eli. Dano D. Lewis prepared two years for Daniel Plain- Plainfield, his character. Think about that. It is awesome as Lewis is, and he is. <laughs> You got to give high respect to Paul Dano. He had much less time to prepare, but he fucking nails his role of Eli Sunday in There Will Be Blood. He goes toe to toe with Daniel Day Lewis in this movie. And he did it. High respect for that actor. You have no idea. That has got to be hard. I don't think people realize how important. Paul Dano was to this movie and how he was able to pull off a performance like that against Lewis. I mean, I think it's monumental. Extremely monumental. He reacted beautifully. I believed him. His emotion was spot on with every scene he did. And most of them were with Lewis. So how hard can that be, right? You think, well, Lewis is one of the greatest ever. How hard is it to work off of Daniel Day-Lewis? And yeah, I'm sure it is uh, easier to work off of Daniel Day-Lewis than some uh, acting uh, student, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, doing their uh, third, uh, I don't know, scene ever in their life. You know, or Daniel Day. I, I, you know, but still. Props. He was good, man. I got it. Although I don't like the guy. <laughs> I, don't. I just, I, Paul, prove me wrong. He just, right? Is that just me? It might be just me. Okay. Uh, those of you who like when I go off on tangents, You may find that interesting. And those of you who don't, I'm sorry. (laughs) That's my show. The the Sunday family, right? The religious aspect of this film. They seem super nice, don't they? When you first see them, right? Daniel's on their land. And they come out like, do you want a meal? Uh, Do you want to set your tent up on our land? You know, we'll get you something. (laughs) They're, They're so nice. Yeah, but they have agendas, don't they? They want money for their church. Religion is so big with them, right? It seems like nothing else matters. Um, but that's not the way you should take religion, in my opinion. Okay, uh, use it, but don't let it run your life. Maybe I'm getting it wrong and I should give everything to God. And that was the Sunday family and how they felt about God. Their religion is that the oil they were going to find in their land will go to the church, man. Every penny. Because that's important. And that's all they care about, right? Not so much. (laughs) And at the end of the film, it's revealed that, hey... We're all human. And I don't care what you preach. I don't care what you believe in. It's all about being a good person. Doing what's right. Okay. Admitting when you're wrong. And trying to be better. Because we all fall on our asses. We all make mistakes. And we all make decisions that hurt others. 
Every single one of us does that. Yeah, you do that, don't you? <laughs> or are you the only perfect person ever in the history of the world? No. And neither is the Sunday family. And there will be blood. There's a deal reached between Daniel and the Sunday family. At the table, one of the sons, of course, Eli, played by Paul Dano, goes and takes Daniel's hand to say a prayer for making the deal. This moment doesn't last long for Daniel pulls his hand away. Hey, (laughs) and it goes to show you right there. There'll be friction between these two characters. You have the highly religious guy wanting to say a prayer. And after a few moments, that's too much for Daniel. I can't handle that. I don't want it. I don't need it. And right there, Paul Thomas Anderson shows the audience that friction will now be between Daniel Plainfield and Eli Sunday. You have confrontation and you need that in a good movie. A brief side note is that all the music in the film was done by Johnny Greenwood. He was a member of the band Radiohead. He was lead guitarist. Love Radiohead. Great band and find it interesting that Paul Thomas Anderson asked Johnny Greenwood to score the film. He had never scored any film before. Uh, It takes people like PTA to fall in love with someone's music, no matter uh, what music they do. Uh, in what venue they're doing it in, or in what way their music takes them in their career. You never scored a movie before? Well, there's always a first time. I think you'd be brilliant doing it. (laughs) And Johnny Greenwood went, oh, you, you think? I don't know. But he does a phenomenal job. I love the music in this film. (laughs) As you can tell, I like a lot of things about this film. And the music is one of them. Brilliantly done. And a side note in the film on the score. Now, Eli Sunday takes members of his church to visit the oil site, the drilling. And you can see Daniel in this scene looking a little iffy about it. He's not happy. It just looks like uh, Daniel Day wants nothing to do with the religious... And he thinks culty atmosphere, a cult, fucking up his business. That aspect of religion and business. You don't want to combine those two. That'll create problems. And he knows that. But I I do want to note that Daniel Plainfield does use religion in his speeches that he gives to clients and so on. Uh, Does he believe in it? No. But he uses it as a prop, just like he uses his son as a prop to profit his business. You know, and businessmen will use almost anything to get the job, to keep getting jobs, and to keep everybody around them happy and believing in him. He's the guy. He's the boss man. He owns it. Everybody's got to believe in him. So if he feels that religion will help, who professes belief in religion. But he, he probably won't be going to church this Sunday. <laughs> but he'll talk about God. Uh, goes to show you that a good salesman will use props to gain business. Now in the film there is a date uh, circled on the calendar for the christening of a big drill that's going to happen. right? And this is a big deal. A big day. And during the christening, Eli Sunday tells Daniel the day before that he wants Daniel to have Eli come up and say a prayer for this monumental and beautiful day. For because God will be a big part of this, it will succeed. And Eli Sunday is adamant to Daniel, you're going to introduce me? I'm going to say a prayer, nothing big. And he told Daniel, listen, it's not going to be anything special. I love how Paul Dano talks to Lewis. 
he, he's incredible. He, the way he explains to Lewis, <laughs> uh, this is how I'm going to do it. Uh, it's not going to be that big. You know? <laughs> and uh, uh, introduce me. And, uh, and we're going to do this. And he's telling Plainfield how to do things. And, and Plainfield doesn't want this squirrely little shit <laughs> telling him what to do, how to do it, and how to do it. And all, though he tells Eli, yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, we're going to do it exactly how you, how, how you say. Uh, very good. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't happen that way. This is significant. Because the day of the christening, Eli Sunday, is all pumped up and ready to go to, you know, say his prayer, give goodwill, <laughs> and really set this thing in motion. The big drill is going to happen. Daniel Day, instead, in his character of Daniel Plainfield, makes it known that Eli <laughs> is not going to be pushing him around and telling him what to do. He actually takes Eli's sister up in front of everybody instead of him and introduces the christening, what happens afterwards, and says, thank you, it's short, it's sweet, and Eli is brushed over. So here's the big fucking question. Because Daniel does this and ignores Eli Sunday, and this very important christening of the drill. Is Dan now cursed because of this decision? Because the rest of the film, it feels that way for Daniel Plainfield. And Dan will also take Mary aside. Now Mary is Eli Sunday's younger sister. Daniel Plainfield takes her aside after the christening. They're all together eating after the christening. And, and has a moment with her. Telling her there'll be no more hitting. Will there? Because the Sunday family are so religious. That any wrongdoing or anything against religion in the family. They get hit. If they're inappropriate or doing something wrong. And Daniel was told. Mary was hit because she didn't pray loud enough. So Daniel took her aside and said, there'll be no more hitting, will there? I won't allow it. And Mary looks at him puzzled and concerned and says, okay, and runs away. But you can tell, sitting right next to Daniel is the father of the little girl, Mary. And he hears this. He hears Daniel say, there'll be no more hitting, now will there be? This shows the dominance that Daniel Plainfield has over this film and the family that uh, the Sundays are. This religious, tough, strict family that Daniel does not approve of. And lets the father know, I know you hit these kids. <laughs> Ain't going to happen around me. You want to be a part of my business and profit from it? We're not going to allow certain things. So, it, does this make Daniel Plainfield a better man? Yes. In the respect, up until that point in the film, it does. He takes in a little boy when his father dies. And now he's protecting Mary from getting hit by her father. And brothers, probably. You're rooting for Daniel Plainfield at this point in the film. And you should. He seems like a good man. Trying to do the right thing. A strong person. You know, sticking up for the little person. I like that. And I root for Daniel Plainfield. He seems like he cares. And in the film, it sure does to this point. I'm going to throw some more adulation towards Paul Dano. When he exercises the demons in the church scene. This is not easy acting. Because um, I think a lot of actors will overdo it so much. You don't believe it. 
Uh, some performances are almost too cartoonish. Okay, it's a good way to describe someone that overacts. It almost seems just it's just unreal and cartoonish. Kabuki. So when I see Paul Dano take on Eli Sunday exercising the demons in the church about midway through the film you see not only great acting but in the character of Eli himself the the craziness the ability to go that far um, in the church where you're convincing people your uh, your congregation that you're actually exercising demons. Folks, it's an act. It's show. It's, it's a Broadway show. <laughs> it's what they do. It's a show. You're convincing others around you that you have the ability to take demons and throw them out of you. <laughs> Whatever it is that's holding you back. This is key to Eli Sunday's world. Convincing others of his bullshit, so to speak. Okay. The most touching scene in the film is when Daniel Day Lewis's son, our so called son, loses his hearing in an accident on site. An explosion happens. The boy's nearby, and the explosion is so severe. That the young boy, his eardrums explode. And he can no longer hear. Now when this happens, of course there's chaos and Daniel Plainfield to make sure the kid's okay. And lays him down. And as he lays him down and Daniel deals with the explosion and comes back. There are, once again, these significant moments between... Uh, father and son or just man and boy doesn't have to be father son it could just be one human being caring for another human being you don't care what relationship you have the intimacy you see between Daniel Day Lewis and the boy (laughs) Lewis holds him and the young boy deaf dealing with that not being able to hear starts to hum like um, um and if you can't hear it he doesn't know he's even making the humming sounds and, and Lewis is holding him and, and comforting him and trying to tell him everything's going to be okay you're going to be fine and and the boy continues hum um and that humming is bothering Lewis it's going through him and around him and everywhere and driving him insane There's nothing he can do for this boy. And the explosion that happens is because of him. His business. It's dangerous. Things happen. And in this case, his boy, his prop, his rock, uh, his his almost everything. And it makes sense in his world. The glue. You know, it's, it's coming apart. This... This image of, of perfection with this incident, the explosion, taking the kid's hearing away is something Daniel Plainfield just can't deal with. It's something he can't understand or fix. And he feels responsible once again, this poor boy. I took his father away for real. And now... I have taken his hearing away. Think about that. What will I do to anybody when you feel so responsible for not only taking his dad away from him, but his hearing as well? This completely ruins Daniel and almost takes something away from him, his soul. Can't deal with it. And in the same respect as this destroys Daniel in some way, as a man, as a human being. Just think of what that poor child is going through now. 
being deaf, dealing with that, making sense of that. Uh, the boy, I would say, is 12, 13 at the time. I mean, I can't even imagine how hard that would be. And I do this in films. Uh, the art form that Paul Thomas Anderson created with the script, the characters, makes me think about stuff like that. Oh, what would happen? Or how would I feel? Uh, little Jeff, when I was 12, and like that, because of an accident, I can't hear anymore. And how would that uh, make me feel? Uh, what would be going through my mind? If I can imagine it. And you can. And how horrible that would be. Yeah. The true beauty of art. For me is opening those doors. Or uh, thought processes into... I don't know, situations, made up situations, and where you can not only imagine it, but almost feel it inside of what that would be like. So that's where film, art in general, puts me. I mean, is that what it does for you? And those who are listening, trying to follow a path of art. Whether it's an actor, a writer, director, painter, whatever the case is. Is that your drive? Is finding uh, little tidbits of that in your life. Where it makes you think about that. Does that make any sense? Out of the realm of your possibility. Where you're doing well. But what if this happened? And how would that make me feel? And then now it's changed you too. In a good way. Making you appreciate what you have. Or if you have a deficiency somewhere else, okay, you can relate to that. Oh my God, I can relate to that, makes sense to me. And I get it. And a film could do that for you. In, in this film, There Will Be Blood, um, Opens up portals of thought, feeling, emotion about family. It's a deep movie. And maybe that's why I'm doing this episode. Is sort of uh, letting me talk about that. That when I watch a movie like this, it brings out that in me. And it makes me appreciate life. It's weird. What is that? <laughs> I love it. I love art. Because it does that. It's, it's amazing to me how uh, Paul Thomas Anderson, in, like, how, uh, no, the, his processed mind in art, uh, how that goes. He read this novel, right, that was written in the 20s, was it? Let me get back to this. Yeah, in 1927, r read uh, Oil. By Upton Sinclair. Was so fascinated by it. Okay. That he wanted to take it a step further. Make it into a movie. Creating characters within his mind. And having like this religious aspect. Uh, family. The whole interest in the oil. Uh, and, and, and sort of stir it. Creating this. And how you were able to just. Sit down and write this screenplay. I mean, he wrote it too. These minds, man. Like Paul Thomas Anderson, his mind is got to be going all the time. I'm, I'm sure it's it's hard for him to shut it off. He probably goes to bed and it's just boom, 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 boom. <laughs> it's probably hard to shut it off. And it makes me think about Heath Ledger. I know I'm going on tangents in this show. I haven't done this show in a while. I apologize. But Heath Ledger was the same way. He was so brilliant. So talented. He found it hard to sleep. The, his brain 
was so genius-like, he couldn't turn off the art. It was always going. Like he, if he found it hard to unwind, because he was so brilliant. That's what like some of these people are like. Maybe Paul Thomas Anderson knows how to unwind, right? An hour before bed, whatever he does, his ritual maybe, <laughs> okay, to sort of let things go. But other artists find it hard to do that. They can, they can, they will uh, turn to drugs, sleeping pills, pain relievers, beer, wine. It's almost inevitable unless you have the ability to just turn it off. Uh, a lot of these artists, they have vices they rely on. There's no doubt about it. And I give high respect to those who don't need that. Artists go through some shit. They have to to give you a great performance. It's a lot of hard work. The, the schedules are difficult. The hours are ridiculous. It's just a lot to handle. So I give a lot of uh, admiration towards these people. Where I can sit down at night, flick on my television set, sit down, and enjoy films and TV shows. Mm. Props. So I could do the actor's room. And this episode, There Will Be Blood, put out in 2007 by Paul Thomas Anderson and Daniel Day-Lewis giving one hell of a performance. Okay, this part in the movie, I don't understand, and I hope somebody can explain it to me, okay? H.W., the son, the so-called son of Daniel Plainfield, the one who just lost his hearing, tries to burn down the house that Daniel and his so-called brother, this new character introduced into the film, is supposed to be Daniel Plainfield's brother, okay, are sleeping at night, and H.W., the son, tries to burn down their house with them sleeping in it. Why does he do that? Why does the son try to kill Daniel Day and his so-called new character brother in the movie? I know, this guy just comes out of nowhere and says, Daniel, I'm your brother. I love you. It's so weird in the script, like PTA just putting this character, boom, because it's so convenient because the son is deaf and Daniel's sort of shutting him out now. So now he needs a new character to come in and be his brother. So the brother will replace the son. So is that why the son tries to burn down the house? Because he feels like this new character, uh, so-called brother will be replacing him? Is that it? This part of the movie doesn't make any sense. I try to make sense of it in my head, and I... I, 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 Really? Like, the son's gonna burn his dad and this new character out of a whim? (laughs) If you can explain it to me, do it in the comments section, because is it just one of those things? Uh, The boy lost his mind for a moment. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm starting to get a little loopy, folks. I'm drinking tea. It's really good. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. Mm. And it spilled all over my notes. Here we go. This ultimately leads to Dan banishing his son. He sends him off to some school. Because Daniel can't deal with this whole deaf thing. He doesn't want to learn sign language. He sends his son off to a school where they can take care of him. Plus, he just doesn't need to see his son right now. It's too frustrating. I'm going to concentrate on business. I have my brother now. And the family thing, family business, will now carry on with me and my brother. I don't need my son. Right? Well, here's a twist. The brother isn't his brother. Uh, This imposter tells Daniel, I met your real brother. He told me his story. 
and I decided to go with it. Please forgive me. <laughs> I'm an imposter. I am fake. I'm sorry. Daniel wants nothing to do with that. He has been uh, ripped apart once again. He believed this guy was his brother. He did. And he's so upset by it. So pissed. He kills him. Now, uh, Daniel Plainfield is now obviously a murderer. And is willing to do anything now. This is where you see the character split for sure. When you decide to murder. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my now of uh, opinion of you. And this character changes dramatically. And it does for me. At this point in the film. PTA decides to do this. Uh, everything leading up to this. That Daniel has went through in his life. Comes to murder. He's that pissed. He can't take it anymore. Fuck you. And you're dead. So how good is Daniel now? Not so good. Moving on. Eli Sunday visits. Uh, the oil site. Again the drill site. And wonders where his money from the drilling is. Uh, Eli Sunday is really into his church. And he wants his money. Uh, Daniel Plainfield frustrated about what just happened to his son. And sick and tired of this guy walking around the site. Starts slapping and beating the shit out of him. Folks. Uh, Daniel Day-Lewis looks like he's really enjoying being the shit out of Paul Dano. Is it because Paul Dano is a little piece of shit? <laughs> <laughs> could be could be could be folks but I don't know <laughs> it really looked like Lewis was having a good time beating the shit out of Paul Dano and dude, Paul Dano screaming like a little girl is fucking perfect cause Daniel Day takes his hair and drags him through the mud it's quite comical, actually. And it works. I mean, I believe it. When Paul Dano cries like a little girl, I believe it. <laughs> Way to go, Daniel Day. Way to go. I believed it. Oh, I did. I believed he took his hair, dragged him through the mud, and made him squeal like a little girl. <laughs> Why? Well, I, I know. I'm so sadistic. I'm enjoying just, I'm reliving it again in my mind uh, right now. <laughs> and I'm actually enjoying it once again in my mind right now. All right. I know, right? Woo, woo, woo. 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 <laughs> okay. Um, right. Okay. Uh huh. Hmm. So, anyway. The next scene, you have Eli and his dad. And Eli expressing how frustrated he is with his father. You know, allowing Daniel Plainfield to come into their lives, drill on their land, and, you know, and sort of give in to this evil person that is Daniel Plainfield. The man who drugged me through the mud by my hair and made me scream like a three-year-old girl with pigtails. That man. How dare you let him into our lives? Another good acting performance scene by Paul Dano. Was it because uh, he just sucked in all of Daniel Day-Lewis in his glorious talent? It could be. <laughs> wow, folks. I can't get enough of this movie. And the characters... The performances, uh, the feel of it, like, and, and it, and because of the music, the score, it works in the feel of it. Uh, just the way the scenes go together, and it seems like almost every scene in this movie is a home run. Like PTA and Lewis, who is in pretty much every scene, got up to the plate every day, <laughs> ate their Wheaties. Whatever it is that they did, okay? And hit a fucking home run every day. How do you do that? Daniel Day-Lewis can't. God bless him. The character of Daniel Plainfield must now 
repent. The sun returns, and you have the dinner scene between Daniel and H.W. It's a very touching scene. And you can tell the separation between them. It's evident. It's hard to watch. The scene's beautiful. It's well done. But it's hard to watch. Daniel's sort of trying to communicate with his son at dinner. And you could tell it's just not going to work. It's too uncomfortable. It's plain as day. Ooh, plain field. Plain as day. It's just not going to work between these two. And me as a viewer of this film, I'm heartbroken by it. I want the relationship between father and son, whatever that is, to work. And it's not. There is now a significant time jump in the film where you have the son H.W. marrying Mary, uh, Eli Sunday's uh, sister. It's uh, a marriage that uh, Daniel Plainfield isn't happy about. He doesn't want to be a part of the Sunday family. <laughs> okay, And he now is. Which is weird. And then you have the father and son showdown. In the next scene. Where you have an of course older HW. The son coming in to confront his father. And telling him that he's leaving. He's creating and starting his own business. Oil business. And he's leaving his father. And of course he is. Because Daniel has made it pretty fucking clear. Through his activities. His emotions and just how he treats H.W. now. He's never been able to deal with the deaf aspect of H.W. He's made it clear. So the son is going to leave. And Daniel expresses how unhappy he is on this decision. And his son will now be his, uh, what do they call that? Adversary. Competition. <laughs> It's a touching, heartbreaking, sad, powerful scene. Uh, one of the top three scenes for me. And I'm just saddened by it. It's inevitable. It should happen. The sun should run far away from Daniel. And he does. This now completes every broken part In Dan's body now. He's a broken man. He has a broken heart. And he has a broken soul. So this of course leads to the Daniel Plainfield and Eli Sunday showdown. You have the son father showdown. And now you have the Eli and Daniel showdown. This is quite an epic scene. I wonder how long it took to do this scene. I'm sure it took a while. A lot going on, highs and lows, and it is loaded with symbolism. First off, Dan won't take the drink that Eli tries to give him. He wants nothing from Eli. And Dan makes Eli pronounce loudly that he is indeed a false prophet. And he makes him repeat it over and over again. Is it because he just wants to hear him say it? (laughs) And how much he's enjoying hearing him say, I am a false prophet. And the only reason why Eli says it is because he wants something from Daniel. He wants money. So he's willing to say anything to get what he wants. And the fact that he makes Eli say it over and over, I am a false prophet. It reminds me of the exercise we used to do in acting class. It's called repetition, saying things over and over again. And how every time you say it, it means just a little bit more to you. And you get it just a little bit more. Repeating yourself does work. It's almost like nailing something. You got the hammer and you're nailing it into the board. And each time you take a whack at it, it goes deeper into the wood. It, it, it really does make sense in that way. 
And that's what Dan is doing to Eli. He's taking the nail and he's got the hammer. And with every whack, (laughs) he's making it pretty clear. He doesn't believe in Eli's bullshit. Never did, never will. And I'm going to bring this fucker down with me. He is as awful as I am. (laughs) Eli, you suck as much as I do. You and me. It also signifies that all is lost. Quote, I drink your water every day. I drink the blood of the lamb from Bandy's tract. End of quote. Is what Daniel tells Eli. When Eli says, there is oil in Bandy's land. Drill it up. I give you permission. Let's make some money. And Daniel tells him, I've done that already. (laughs) All the oil is drained. I've drained it all. I've sucked it in. (laughs) I'm the man. You are nothing. And then he gives the milkshake thing. And what does that mean? It means just that. I have a milkshake, which are yummy. (laughs) I think we all can agree on that. Milkshakes, they taste pretty good. You have a milkshake. I have a milkshake. Mmm. And he goes and stands back and says, and I have a straw that goes all the way over to your milkshake. And I suck it out. (laughs) I'm going to drink my milkshake and I'm going to drink your milkshake. And ultimately, Dan kills Eli. I'm finished, he says. And so is this episode of The Actor's Room. Thank you for listening. I went on and on. I might edit some shit out. If I don't, that's my show. There Will Be Blood, 2007, written and directed by Paul Thomas Anderson and Daniel Day-Lewis giving one of the greatest acting performances ever in the history of film. And I know some will say that Gangs of New York was better. You might be right, because that was great as well. But this one is deeper. And maybe that's why I give it a little more respect and credit. He went deep with this character of Daniel Plainfield. And because of that, that's what makes this film so successful. And if you do research on PTA, the director of this film, and how he feels about Daniel Day-Lewis, it is so obvious how much he respects Daniel Day. And how he thanks his lucky stars above that Lewis was able to do this role. Because PTA knows nobody could ever have done it better. That's how amazing Daniel Day-Lewis is. Watch how amazing he is as Daniel Plainfield in this film. I can't say anything more than that. It speaks for itself. He's flawless. As that character. His emotions make sense. In every scene he does. Yes. He takes a few years. (laughs) Preparing for the role. And by God it shows. Daniel Day. I miss you. Daniel Day. uh, I love you. In in your acting ability. Do I miss you. And I find it very interesting as I end this episode, a little tidbit, a very fascinating tidbit about Daniel Day-Lewis is this. He makes it pretty plain in interviews in the past about his childhood. And he has said he grew up as a commoner. Okay. Sort of middle of the road. In terms of wealth. And how he was brought up. Folks. That's not true. 
Daniel Day-Lewis was brought up in a high society family. He was dressed up in suits, uh, like tuxedos and shit, tails, they said, with gleaming shoes uh, to go for a walk. That's how his childhood was. He grew up in a high society environment. And he never wants to talk about it. Because he wants to be like everybody else. He was ashamed of being in high society. And you could tell just by the way he talks and presents himself. You could see it. He has that. But he never wants to admit it. And if you don't do research on him. You would take his word to be like yeah. He grew up in a pretty uh, median household. You know, his parents were like school teachers and shit. That's not the case. He was well bred. And the fact that he doesn't like to admit that, that he finds it better to be classified as a commoner, just like everybody else, well, most people anyway. Goes to show what kind of person he is. Down to earth. Salt of the earth. Man. Give high respect to that man. Why did you have to quit though, man? I miss you. We miss you. Those who love acting performances like that. Dan. There will be blood. That character you play, man. Brother, sir, I'm, I can't be speechless about it, but I almost want to be. It's almost too good. Um, thank you. Thank you, Daniel Day. Thank you, PTA. And thank all of you out there, listeners, for tuning in to this episode of The Actors Room. My name's Jeff. May you go on tonight, watch something good. All right. <laughs> Hopefully you put in something good. I don't know what I'm going to watch tonight. We'll see. Uh, I've been dragging a bit today, but I wanted to put this show out. And I'm glad I did. One of my favorites. Maybe I should watch something Daniel Day tonight. Hmm. I've seen everything he's done. and It's not much. Look at his resume, folks. I, I can't explain it. How someone who did it just a handful of films is classified as the greatest actor ever. How the hell did he do that? How did he do that? How the hell did he... All right. I'm going to end it right now. Thank you for listening. Have a great day. Have a nice evening. God bless you. Have a good one.